Imagine holding your MacBook right now. Sleek, slim, shiny. It didn't start life looking like that at all. What you're holding was once a chunky block of metal, and the journey it takes to become a MacBook is one of the most high-tech glow-ups in the world. Let's step inside Apple's factories and see how that transformation actually happens. When people think of Apple, they usually picture the polished end result. That sleek silver laptop resting on a cafe table, glowing logo catching the light like some kind of status badge. But the truth is, the real story begins much earlier, in a setting that feels less like a futuristic tech lab and more like an industrial warehouse stacked with raw materials. The MacBook's journey starts with aluminum. And not just any aluminum, this is high-grade, carefully chosen metal that has to strike the balance between strength, lightness, and style. Over the years, Apple has doubled down on using recycled aluminum, which means the slab that eventually becomes your MacBook might have once lived a very different life. As part of a soda can, a bicycle frame, or even an older MacBook that was returned and broken down for parts. Now picture those raw aluminum blocks rolling into the factory. They're chunky, plain, and about as glamorous as a brick. No sleek curves, no elegant ports, no delicate hinges. Just heavy rectangular slabs of dull metal. If you handed one to a stranger on the street and told them it was the first step to making a MacBook Air, they'd probably laugh. But that's where the real magic of Apple's process begins. Because in the next stage, machining transforms those lifeless blocks into something that starts to look unmistakably like a MacBook. The block heads straight into what looks like a lineup of robotic dentists armed with spinning drills. These are CNC machines, computer numerical control systems that can carve aluminum with ridiculous precision. Think of them as sculptors that never blink, never sneeze, and never lose focus, no matter how long they've been working. Each one attacks the slab from different angles, shaving off ribbons of shiny metal and slowly revealing the outline of a MacBook body. At first, it's barely noticeable, just a shallow hollow here, a slot there. But after multiple passes, the rough block begins to look less like raw material and more like the sleek frame we all recognize. The process is slow, deliberate, and oddly hypnotic to watch. You can almost imagine the machine sketching with drills, carving out the keyboard opening, the trackpad cutout, the vents for airflow, and the precise frame that will hold the logic board. Even the speaker holes are laser drilled so finely they look like they've been poked with a needle. Nothing is left to chance. Every curve and corner is executed with an exactness that borders on obsession. Because one misalignment here could mean a lid that won't close properly, a port that sits crooked, or a keyboard that rattles under your fingers. Apple simply doesn't allow that. Their engineers chase tolerances down to fractions of a millimeter, because that's what it takes to create that feeling of seamless perfection. And here's the surprisingly clever part. All that aluminum that gets shaved away doesn't just vanish into a trash bin. The curls, flakes, and powder are carefully collected and recycled right back into the system. Some of it might become part of another MacBook down the line, or maybe an iPhone case, or even something as simple as the internal structure of an accessory. It's a closed loop, a kind of aluminum circle of life. In a weird way, it's like a sourdough starter. You keep feeding it, keep reusing it, and it just keeps creating new things. Only in this case, instead of bread, it's fueling the creation of some of the most coveted laptops in the world. Once the outer shell is carved, the next stage is polishing and finishing. If you've ever wondered why a MacBook feels smoother than most other laptops, it's because the shells go through a spa treatment that would put most luxury cars to shame. Each piece is tumbled, brushed, and polished until it shines. Workers and machines check for imperfections because Apple's design language demands absolute uniformity. No weird edges, no tiny scratches. Just perfect silky aluminum. Now comes the coloring. Anodization gives the aluminum that iconic silver, space gray, or gold finish. This isn't just paint, it's an electrochemical process that alters the surface of the metal itself, making it tougher against scratches and corrosion. And because it's embedded in the material, the color doesn't chip off like regular paint. That's why your MacBook can survive years of coffee shop abuse 
and still look like it belongs in a museum of modern design. Meanwhile, in another part of the factory, the guts of the MacBook are being prepared. If the aluminum shell is the skeleton, then the logic board is the brain and nervous system. Tiny chips are placed onto the board with robotic precision. Processors, memory modules, storage chips, controllers. Apple's own silicon chips, like the M-series processors, are designed in-house but fabricated at specialized plants before being shipped to the assembly line. The logic board is small but densely packed. Every millimeter matters. Engineers plan out the placement so heat flows away properly, signals don't interfere, and everything fits into that impossibly thin body. Once the boards are tested and approved, they're ready to meet their shiny new shells. Assembly is where the orchestra begins. Imagine rows of partially built MacBooks moving down conveyor belts. Human workers handle some steps, placing the keyboard, attaching the trackpad, slotting in batteries, while robotic arms handle repetitive or delicate moves like tightening screws with exact torque. It's teamwork between man and machine. The keyboard deserves a moment of its own. It's not just a slab of plastic keys. Each key is engineered for travel distance, spring tension, and click feel. Apple has learned this the hard way. Remember the controversial butterfly keyboard? These days, every key is tested for consistency because the keyboard is one of the things users touch most. The trackpad gets similar attention. It's not actually clicking like you think. It uses haptics to simulate the feel of a click. That's why you can click anywhere on the surface, and it feels the same. Then there's the battery, one of the trickiest parts. Apple wants maximum capacity inside a slim frame, so the batteries are often custom-shaped to fit around other components. They're installed with strong adhesives to save space, which makes repair annoying. But from Apple's perspective, it's about efficiency and rigidity. Every battery is tested for charging safety, temperature stability, and durability. Nobody wants a MacBook that overheats or swells. Displays are another masterpiece. Each screen is tested for brightness, sharpness, and color accuracy before being attached. Apple calibrates them at the factory so you can open your MacBook and instantly get accurate colors, whether you're editing photos or binging Netflix. Cameras, microphones, speakers, they all get tested too. The speakers especially are tuned within the factory so they don't just play sound, they sound like a MacBook should, full, rich, and balanced despite the tiny space. Once all the parts are assembled into the shell, the MacBook still isn't ready to meet its future owner. Now it enters the phase that Apple is notorious for, quality control. Think of this as boot camp for laptops. They're powered on, connected, and put through a barrage of tests. Ports are checked to make sure they all work. Keyboards are typed on by robots that simulate years of typing in a few hours. Hinges are opened and closed thousands of times. Displays are flickered through test patterns. Fans are spun up to check cooling. It's relentless, but it's why you rarely hear about a MacBook failing straight out of the box. Some units go through burn-in testing, where they're run under stress for extended periods. If a capacitor fails, if a chip overheats, if a display flickers, those units are pulled and scrapped or reworked. It's ruthless but necessary. Imagine the PR disaster if thousands of MacBooks hit the shelves and died within a week. Apple avoids that with intense factory testing. After a MacBook survives all those trials, it gets cleaned, polished again, and then packaged. Apple's packaging is its own design marvel. Minimal, protective, and strangely satisfying to unbox. The boxes are made to stack neatly for shipping efficiency, and the internal trays are designed to cradle the MacBook without needing tons of plastic. Even the way the plastic wrap peels off is engineered for a wow moment. At this point, the MacBooks are ready to be shipped around the globe. Pallets of pristine boxes head to distribution centers, then to Apple stores, retailers, or directly to customers who clicked buy online. By the time you open yours at home, it's already survived one of the most tightly controlled manufacturing journeys in tech. Now let's zoom out for a second. All of this, the aluminum, the machining, the boards, the assembly lines, the packaging, it doesn't happen in one single building. It's spread across a network of factories, suppliers, and logistics hubs. Apple coordinates an insanely complex supply chain, pulling in components from different parts of the world. Screens might come from one place, chips from another. 
collect batteries from somewhere else, all converging at the assembly line. If one part of that chain hiccups, the whole system feels it. That's why Apple's factories are so secretive and so tightly managed. They don't just build laptops, they build predictability. Every machine, every worker, every supplier is part of a synchronized dance designed to churn out millions of MacBooks that are nearly indistinguishable from each other. If you buy a MacBook in New York and your friend buys one in Tokyo, they should feel identical. Same hinge resistance, same trackpad click, same keyboard feedback. That consistency is one of Apple's biggest flexes. What's wild is how much unseen detail goes into this process. Little things most people never even notice, yet they make a massive difference in the final product. Take the screws, for example. Those tiny fasteners holding your MacBook together aren't pulled off some random hardware store shelf. Apple designs them specifically for the MacBook, fine-tuning the size, the thread, even the shape of the head. Why? Because they want them to fit flawlessly, resist stripping, and yes, make it harder for just anyone to crack open the laptop with a basic screwdriver. It's part durability, part security, and part Apple being, well, Apple. The same obsessive thinking applies to glue and adhesives. These aren't just blobs of sticky stuff. They're carefully engineered compounds chosen for their weight, strength, and resilience under heat. They have to hold components tight inside a paper-thin frame without adding bulk or compromising longevity. It's the kind of decision that most users never consider, yet it plays a huge role in why a MacBook feels so seamless when you pick it up. Then there's the environmental side, which has become one of Apple's loudest talking points, but it's more than marketing. Every curl of aluminum shaved off during machining is swept up and recycled back into the system. Plastic in the packaging is minimized or replaced with paper alternatives, and even the inks used for printing on boxes are chosen with sustainability in mind. Hazardous materials like mercury or brominated flame retardants, once common in electronics, have been systematically reduced or eliminated. And beyond the good for the planet angle, there's a very real business logic here. If Apple can recycle its own aluminum, it reduces reliance on outside suppliers and fluctuating raw material prices. If its packaging is designed to ship more efficiently, lighter, smaller, easier to stack, that saves millions in logistics costs over time. So yes, it's about image and responsibility, but it's also about efficiency. In Apple's world, green is both eco-friendly and very profitable. So the next time you crack open your MacBook at a coffee shop, remember the journey it took from a raw block of aluminum to a precision milled shell, from tiny chips to an integrated logic board, from stress testing to final packaging. It's a story of obsession, of design philosophy turned into manufacturing reality. Apple doesn't just build laptops, they choreograph an entire production ballet to make sure that what lands in your hands feels almost too perfect. And that's the world inside Apple's factories. A world where machines carve metal like artists. Humo humans fine-tune every detail. And the end result is the MacBook you know and love. If you enjoyed taking this tour with me, hit that like button, drop a comment telling me which part surprised you the most, and subscribe so we can keep exploring the stories behind the tech we use every day.